Hello and welcome to this special event exploring a net zero carbon future for the construction industry. My name is Mariam Mashiri. Now there's no denying that over the last few years there's been a marked shift in attitude and commitment across businesses in the UK and globally when it comes to setting carbon targets. Despite the current unique problems caused by the coronavirus pandemic, it seems now more than ever is the time to focus on delivering those targets. Time to move from words to action. Now, during this program, we'll be looking at the challenges faced by the construction industry with our panel of leading experts and also examining the potential solutions. We'll be tackling the big five emission sources in the industry, electricity, heat, combustion engines, waste and materials. And we consider collaboration, often seen as the panacea for everything. We'll be asking what role can it really play in reaching net zero? Now, this event is designed to enable open and progressive discussion about carbon neutral construction. I've been talking to the mayor of Bristol, who told me he wants the city to be the greenest in the UK. And he also highlighted what he believes are some of the challenges ahead for the construction industry. We now need to go into a time where we rebuild our cities, reconceptualise what they are and how they function, plan them and actually build them. The people with the expertise to do that are in the construction uh, sector. Be expansive, be imaginative and uh, be leaders. And going energy positive, how Powerhouse in Norway could be an inspiration for the UK. Powerhouse is a building that creates more energy than it uses during its lifetime operation, but it also includes the uh, embodied energy in the materials. Uh, the construction phase and the end of life disposal of the building. And that's the difference between powerhouse and a traditional energy positive building. We want you to be involved as well, so do be sure to take part in our live polls. Well, I'm joined in the studio by Greg Craig, President and CEO of Skanska UK, and Julie Hiragoyen, the Chief Executive of the UK Green Building Council. Welcome to both of you. Thanks very much for taking the time. Julie, to you first. Set the scene for us a bit here. How significant do you believe is the role of the UK construction industry in terms of carbon emissions? Sure. I mean, the built environment is responsible for something like 40% of our national carbon footprint. It's about 350 megatons of CO2 equivalent every year so it's very substantial and um, that breaks down to about half of that is energy use within buildings um, you know heating cooling lighting cooking and so on uh, another third is road and rail transport and then the last sort of 15 or so percent is the construction process itself and construction materials which make up this sort of embodied carbon um, in the construction process um, make up 11 percent of our global emissions so uh, unsurprisingly, it's often uh, a, a very big focal point for our efforts to decarbonise and to get to net zero carbon by 2050. And the flip side to that is uh, property and construction are often cited as some of our most cost effective levers to decarbonise the economy. Mm. Greg, how good is the industry, do you think, at tackling emissions? Well, I think we're making some progress, but it, it's a huge range in reality. I mean, at one end, we've got some really good innovations, <clears throat> really good innovations uh, coming in. Um, but at the other end, we've probably got a fair number of companies setting targets, but not really taking any action. So is it heading in the right direction, do you think? Um, I say we are making progress, but I think the real answer to that has got to be no when you consider the scale of the problem. I mean, if we remember that the scientists told us about this problem, uh, very clearly back in the late 70s and early 80s and we haven't really achieved a huge amount since then so in reality we've wasted nearly 40 years. I think that we are uh, missing some of the collaboration potential insofar as uh, this must be uh, a multi-industry um, tackle uh, on this and we're not using the maximum collaboration that the construction industry can generate to, to achieve that. And then lastly, I think we've got to be tackling this from a let's uh, tackle the biggest problems first. So where are the, the, the biggest emissions? And in the construction industry, that's steel and cement. And that's 40 percent of our issue. We've got to tackle those first. Do you think cost is the main blocker here, Greg? Well, it's certainly one of the biggest excuses uh, for, for not taking action. 
Um, in reality, no, I don't, because we're looking for substantial uh, action, substantial impact. And in order to get a substantial change, you need to think quite big. Uh, and when you think quite big and you get some really quite radical options, quite often those options uh, are big cost savings. OK, well, thank you for that. There's a, a real imperative now, isn't there, for immediate action. I went to Bristol to speak to the mayor, Marvin Rees. He's openly pledged the city will be carbon neutral by 2030. What kind of city is Bristol to live in in 2020? Depends who you are. Uh, different people, different communities experience Bristol incredibly differently. I'm one of those that's experienced it in many different ways. Two world-class universities, lots of green space, thriving creative sector, new home of Channel 4. But we got one in four of our children living in income-deprived households. Bristol has the aim of being a net zero carbon city by 2030. Why do you think this target is so important? So decarbonising the economy also makes space for the economy to grow. It's going to be one of the huge breaks on, on prosperity in the future if all prosperity comes with a high carbon price because we'll create the conditions for future climate shocks. So this is the pathway to growth and dynamism, jobs and, and prosperity also. How are you going to achieve this though? Well, we're working together uh, um, as a city. One of the things we recognise is that what Bristol is is not delivered by the local authority alone. Hence the, what we call the Bristol One City approach, which is all um, online and our One City plan, which brings together local government, other public sector organisations, business, unions, uh, civil society organisations to work together to look at our, our collective um, impact on Bristol. What's your message to the construction industry? What do you want them to know about how industry, developers, private businesses like that can help Bristol achieve its net zero carbon goal? I think I'd say to the construction industry that I, I hope they can be fully aware of the scale of the challenge and the opportunity they face. We need to rebuild the planet. One of our problems uh, is that our cities have grown up with no regard to the way the systems impact on our carbon limits or the destruction of nature. We, we now need to go into a time where we rebuild our cities, reconceptualise what they are and how they function, plan them and actually build them. The people with the expertise to do that are in the construction uh, sector and, and, and thinking about not just building individual units, but getting into the business of city systems uh, so that when people get rid of their waste, when they turn on their tap, when they go to buy food, they are participating in systems, whether those people know it or not, that are low carbon. The construction sector can be a part of that. Be expansive, be imaginative and uh, be leaders. And I think it is a, like I said, it comes with a great deal of responsibility and pressure, but what an amazing pressure to, to take on. Well, after this programme, we'll be releasing an extended version of that interview with the Mayor of Bristol. Now, though, let's take a look at the first of our polls. We asked you, the audience, to ask, answer a number of questions. The first one was, uh, who can make the biggest contribution to reaching carbon targets? And... Uh, as you can see from those, you believe that the government makes the biggest contribution potentially to reaching those carbon targets. Interesting there what people in the audience think. Greg, do you agree with them? I do agree, actually, because the, it's the government that spans our entire industry and they can create uh, incentives and disincentives that businesses in particular uh, do listen to or the public sector. And it's the government that then has the ability to spread that from one industry across all industries. So I do agree. What about the construction industry? What role does it have to play with the government? Well, I, I think we've got to make sure that the government gives us incentives, disincentives, motivating factors that will actually work. So we need to feed back to them whether it is working or not. Julie, I see you nodding there. Do you agree with the audience who are watching and with Greg? I think, um, you know, when one thinks there, there were over 300,000, or at least a few years ago, there were over 300,000 firms in the construction sector alone. Clearly, like in any sector, there are sort of laggards and uh, companies like Skanska that are, that are well ahead and really ambitious. So government has to play a part in, in kind of um, you know, the level playing field, making sure that everyone comes up to a certain standard. That's absolutely critical. But I think business and all of those different sectors that were mentioned on in the poll are critical to play their part in achieving the, the, the decarbonisation of our whole built environment. And in a sense, business and or industry and government 
are in a bit of an ambition sort of loop. They need each other um, to keep driving, uh, ratcheting up the standards. OK, Greg, Julie, thank you very much for that. Now, we're going to start our discussion by talking about the big five emission sources. They are, of course, electricity, heat, combustion engines, waste materials. I'd like to bring in one of our other panellists now, Peter Miller, Environment and Town Planning Director at HS2. Peter, thanks so much for joining us on our panel today. How do you at HS2 plan to reduce emissions during the construction of HS2? Well, as a government organisation, HS2 takes its carbon and, in fact, all emissions um, really very seriously. Um, we've introduced a 50% carbon reduction target in our construction contracts. Um, we're encouraging our supply chain to reduce carbon through design um, using um, techniques like BREAM and SQL. We've got a comprehensive innovation program in train and uh, through our integrated um, project teams that's bringing um, the client organization together with the supply chain i think we've got leadership and uh, the framework for collaboration in the right place and um, we're also looking at the ways to be sort of kept kept honest um, taking account of our actions and, and we expect to be past 2080 certified um, in the coming days in fact so I think overall um, we're in great shape as a project to uh, um, make some further carbon reductions um, and make a really big uh, contribution to, to, to net zero over the coming years. What do you think, Peter, are the greatest challenges for HS2 in terms of emission sources? I think the, the you know the fundamental challenge is really to take the fossil fuels out of everything that we do. Um, and in construction that um, centres our activity around um, the concrete and steel that goes into the build. Um, we've got to do a lot more by way of innovation to um, reduce that materials usage. And of course the energy content which is associated with the production of um, the raw materials cement getting out of the ground um, and the production of steel. But I think the second thing that we um, need to think about is uh, just how much stuff we're moving around. The, the materials that are coming out of the ground, the um, bits and pieces of um, concrete and equipment that we've got to get out on site to actually build the railway. Um, we need to be able to minimise the plant and equipment and lorries that we're using and then ultimately um, get into a place where we're using um, the best plants and equipment out on site that we can. Peter, thanks for that. Let's bring Julie and Greg back into this because I want to talk about electricity. Julie, how important do you think electricity is in reducing carbon emissions? It's really, really important. Um, I mean, building and construction activities in the UK are still largely diesel powered. And, um, uh, you know, one of the main sources of emissions on a construction site would be the exhaust fumes of machinery and vehicles and equipment and so on. And there's lots of benefits of taking, um, you know, electrifying some of those. Um, noise reduction would be a, a key one, um, but also it's, it makes more financial sense. I mean, they're lower cost to operate and to run um, and uh, they don't produce waste like engine oils and filters and all of those bits and pieces. Um, but also we need to be thinking about electrifying. You know, we, we still have lots of diesel generators on construction sites that's the, the norm so in the future I think we, we should be seeing um, sites uh, prior to construction starting that are already connected to grid and that are able to connect to, that are able to procure or generate more renewable forms of energy whether that's biofuels or green power purchase agreements or green tariffs um, and that they're doing that in a, in a smarter way as possible and Greg I've heard about the successful uh, zero emission quarry in Sweden created by Volvo and by Skanska. But how close are we really to an all-electric construction site? Well, I think what we've done in Sweden with collaborating with Volvo there uh, is really about proving it's possible, proving it's possible to turn what was a working quarry into now a fully electric quarry, a working quarry. It was driverless uh, as well. Um, so that's at one end of the scale, proving things is possible. Um, but. In, in reality, in the UK, we're doing quite well with the smaller equipment, um, but batteries uh, are the problem for the big equipment. So the big piling machines, the really big uh, uh, excavators that we use, um, we still need to tackle that. And that may well be where hydrogen uh, comes in. 
That's really interesting. I wanted to talk to you all about waste because recycling has very much become a way of life for so many of us within the house. But what about in the construction industry and on construction sites? Julie, to you first, how much waste does the industry actually produce? So construction, demolition and excavation is the single biggest source of waste for us here in the UK. 60% um, of our waste comes from this sector. Um, uh, and you know, over 30 million um, tons going straight to landfill every year. Um, the the uh, the reason for that is often you know we're um, you know we're overordering materials. Um, we're leaving them on site without looking after them. We're, we're that they're, they're getting damaged, um, off cuts. You know, so there's a, there's a really sort of profligate and linear uh, use of stuff. Um, something like 13 percent of all construction materials that come straight to site go straight to landfill. Um, so we're, we're obviously getting something wrong and, and the piece that's perhaps less well understood is the plastics uh, bit of that. Um, so a huge amount of packaging, um, construction industry is responsible for almost a quarter of total plastic produced in the UK and in terms of packaging waste, um, the scale of packaging from the construction sector is probably about three times that of all households in the UK. So it's, it's really, really substantial. In that is a substantial figure. Peter, how are you at HS2? cutting waste? Well, our, our approach is to avoid waste entirely. Um, and the way to look at it is to try and keep those materials um, that are either we're taking out of the ground or that we're using to uh, build the railway um, in the chain of utility. Um, or the modern way of thinking is the, the, the circular economy. So thinking about it um, in a way to reuse materials and perhaps um, take a leaf out of um, uh, the old saying of being a bit more thrifty about things is probably the way to go. Um, I've got a, I'm sponsoring a project um, uh, that will look at utilising the waste material coming out of the Chilton tunnels at the moment. Um, and the idea of that is to spread those chalk materials across um, 100 hectares of um, a construction site and to treat those to um, create something called calcareous grassland. What that does in the first instance is it removes all of the lorry movements off of the um, uh, roads, so we don't have all the diesel fumes from lorry movements, keeps it on site, and then we can change and restore that site to something which is green, which is bigger and better, and contributes to net gain um, as part of our biodiversity plan. So that's really what we should be doing, thinking smart about um, reuse of material. Uh, that's really interesting, actually, Peter. I can see, Julie, you're nodding at that. I think you like that project, don't you? Yeah, no, I think the, this whole concept of the circular economy is we're, we're sort of in the foothills um, of, of implementing this within the sector. But absolutely uh, echo what Peter was saying in terms of designing waste out of the process in the first place and designing for disassembly, designing for much more adaptability and flexibility. Um, all, of the, all of these things um, would be far less linear than the process that we utilise today. OK, Peter, Julie, Greg, stay right there, uh, because we want to talk now about materials, one of the biggest sources of emissions in construction. In fact, Skanska says cement and steel account for over 40 percent of its annual emissions. Well, we're joined now by Jeremy Greenwood, who is from Tarmac. And Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. Tarmac is, of course, a huge materials producer. What are you doing in this area? Well, good morning. I think I should start by saying that as an industry, uh, the UK construction materials industry recycles more than 90% of construction demolition waste back into its products. We at Tarmac are the largest producer of recycled aggregates, uh, and we actually consume nearly a million tonnes of recycled asphalt planings back into our asphalt, obviously saving energy in terms of production and also the bitumen. If we focus on cement and ready mix concrete, uh, in the UK, we consume 300 times as much waste as we produce in the manufacture of cement and the ready mix concrete, consuming 8 million tonnes a year of other industries' waste in our processes. And I think part of the waste story and, and the circular economy that Judy spoke about a minute ago is the durability. Uh, we have many of our products that are more durable, will last longer, and therefore produce less waste. Uh, we actually uh, resurfaced Oxford Street uh, nearly 10 years ago now. Uh, that road has already been down more than twice as long as the previous road surfaces used to last. So obviously, by building better in the first place, reduces the production of waste in the long term. Jeremy, do you think it's possible to have net zero cement then? 
Well, that's a very timely question. Our, our trade association, the MPA UK Concrete, uh, produced just two weeks ago uh, a document of the, the roadmap to uh, beyond net zero. Uh, I should start by saying that the UK cement industry has already reduced CO2 emissions by more than 50% since 1990. Uh, and what that roadmap lays out is, is a journey to firstly net zero and then beyond. Uh, by reducing the, the CO2 emissions from our power, from our transport, our production process, we can save another 40%, uh, leaving 60%, which we'd look to remove through carbon capture and storage uh, and carbon capture and usage. Uh, and that usage would be in our own production process, things like uh, curing precast concrete. Once we've got to zero, we then get beyond net zero, uh, because most of your, your viewers will know that the concrete reabsorbs um, carbon during its lifetime, recarbonation. It's a process that happens naturally to all concrete. And a further 12% of the CO2 from production will be reabsorbed during the lifetime of the concrete. Uh, and then if we saw earlier on the, on the powerhouse uh, from Scandinavia, the thermal mass of buildings means that uh, buildings can be cooled and indeed heated through the thermal mass of the concrete, reducing energy and consumption. Uh, the office I'm sitting in now has no air conditioning. It, it's cooled through the fabric of the building through the concrete. And that sees a further 44% reduction in CO2. So, yes, we can get to net zero and indeed beyond. OK, Jeremy, thanks for that. Let's bring our other panellists all uh, back in. Greg, to you, has the industry really woken up, do you think, to the challenges it faces with materials? I, I think we've, we've woken up to it, yes, which is a start. But I don't think we've woken up to the point at which we're jumping straight up and getting stuck into some action quickly, really quickly. Because as I said at the beginning, we are running out of time. Uh, and I think if, we were, if that was happening, then we would be seeing much, much more change in the designs that are coming through and the standards and specifications that are setting. So uh, good start, long way to go. Peter, how do you think we could increase the use of low carbon alternatives? Well, here at HS2, um, we've got quite a comprehensive um, innovation program, um, and we'll shortly be launching a carbon dedicated innovation program um, for the, the project as a whole, and that will draw in the whole of the supply chain. Um, a few of the projects that we've got on, on, on the go at the moment are um, reducing steel out of, um, of the steel in rebar, um, which is used for the concrete foundations and structures, for example. We expect to be getting 4% steel out of um, that innovation project. Um, we're sharing that knowledge across the piece with all of our suppliers, um, and that will make a huge difference to the material content and the carbon reduction uh, of HS2. We're, um, we're helping the industry. Um, we've got to think about supporting the industry as well um, by retrofitting um, diesel plants and equipment to get that to uh, stage five so that they can use um, their existing plants and equipment for longer. But we're also proving concepts um, for moving um, Euro 6 lorries um, towards a, um, a hydrogen retrofit technology so that we're actually going to take um, carbon out of the lorries um, in due course. But all of that takes a little bit of time and we need to be supportive as client um, across the industry to make all of that happen. Jeremy, it takes time, Peter says. What challenges do you face in pushing your low carbon products? Well, I echo what Peter said about time. I think uh, construction is a very conservative industry, uh, looking at codes and standards and norms from for many years ago, and, and they do take time to change. Uh, I think we often see the client is usually the most forward thinking, and as in the case of HS2, uh, and then we get engineers, specifiers, and, and often the construction companies themselves who, who slow things down. Uh, for us, I think the key challenge is early engagement. There's a huge amount we can do, a huge amount of our products and solutions that are available that are much more uh, eco-friendly, much lower carbon, uh, and it's having the chance to discuss those and how they can be built into the process. So I think early engagement is key. And the other thing is whole life cost. I think whole life cost in terms of pounds, but whole life cost in terms of CO2. Um, often the, the upfront solution may be slightly more expensive or slightly higher CO2. But if it were to last two, three or four times longer or perform better in use, then the savings can be seen there. Greg, what do you think? Well, I, I, I'm, I was sort of the, the, the piece that really jumped out at me was the, the fact that contractors potentially a bit slow. Uh, I take on uh, Jeremy's challenge. Uh, I think we need to recognise that maybe we are, uh, you know, and, and we've got to sort that out. 
Um, so I'll take that one on. OK, well, fair enough. Julie, we've heard about what Tarmac is doing there from Jeremy, but do you think there's enough R&D investment across the wider industry? I think we're seeing some really exciting, uh, innovative new products coming to market, um, particularly exciting are the whole sort of biomanufacturing, so uh, mycelium or fungal um, insulation materials or food waste that gets turned into, um, you know, the alternatives to wood panels, um, bricks that don't need uh, adhesives or mortar and that sort of, you know, are reusable, um, and even new business models, leasing rather than um, procuring and, and, and so on. Um, but the reality is the actual R&D investment by this sector is much, much lower than other sectors. Um, so, um, you know, I think back in 2016, about 200 million, just over 200 million invested in R&D. That compares with over 3 billion by the automotive or 2 billion by aerospace. So they're really big quantums of difference. And to, to, um, to really, uh, you know, accelerate the decarbonisation of, of the embodied bit, I think we need both. We need these exciting new products and materials and we need the, the you know, the, the, some of the work that we're hearing um, Jeremy talk about in terms of decarbonising our existing construction materials. And that requires clients to demand it. That requires us to be much, much more confident um, about the future uh, sort of pipeline of sales uh, for some of those because they require significant investment. Why do you think, Julie, that the R&D investment isn't quite there from the construction industry compared to other industries? Well, particularly in this area, I think the, the uh, client demand is not uh, creating sufficient pull. Um, because if it were, let's just take for public procurement as an example. Um, if this, you know, if embodied carbon were a critical component of uh, public procurement contracting, then there's no doubt we'd see a greater level of investment going into sort of taking some of that out. Um, so I think we need that sort of poor, you know, supply and demand um, piece to come in. I think we need, we need much more sort of client um, collaboration and uh, client demand. Peter, what do you respond to that? Collaboration and client demand is the way forward? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And um, I think we're starting to see this come through on a project like um, HS2. I like to describe it as a super mega project. Um, uh, most of the supply chain are involved with HS2 in one way or another. Um, and of course, government's investing billions in HS2. Um, and we want the best from those um, uh, contractors and those manufacturers. And on a daily basis, um, they are coming to me saying that, what can we do to innovate? And I think a project like ours, um, uh, uh, with its market force, is showing the, 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 the direction over the next couple of generations. And I think that means that uh, the industry can get much more confident in uh, innovating, uh, bringing in new technologies, um, and knowing that they're not going to be sort of left aside um, just as we move on. We're on the block for a, a good period of time, and I think it's going to make a huge difference. So um, we're right at the epicentre of this and I think that um, we are going to make a huge change to the carbon reduction in the UK. Greg, you're nodding to that. I mean, innovation, investment, these are all buzzwords, aren't they? And they do make a difference. Yeah, they do. And I, I agree with Peter. The, the, the opportunity with the large projects, the likes of High Speed 2 or Crossrail or the Olympics, uh, is that they, one, they have bigger budgets, uh, they have uh, that they have mechanisms for collaboration uh, in it and usually the large projects leave a legacy behind. The Olympics left some really good uh, occupational health behind. Crossrail, for instance, changed vehicle emissions in London and I'm looking forward to seeing what High Speed 2 leaves behind. Julie, do you agree with that assessment? These uh, bigger projects seem to make a difference, don't they? Because they remain even after they're done, even after they're finished and completed? Yeah, I mean, as they should. I think these are, I liked the um, analogy of mega super projects, or <laughs> I can't remember. Um, so, you know, the sense of scale is absolutely phenomenal. So if we can't achieve some of these goals where the scale is that large, I mean, the scale typically makes some of this easier, both, both in terms of, um, you know, affordability and collaboration and, and sort of partnership and, and so on. So I think they do, dem they, they are sort of demonstrator projects for the rest of the industry to look towards and, and they should leave a sense of legacy. They should take the whole industry forward um, on at least one or more areas. But Greg, smaller projects also are important, aren't they? Aren't they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the key innovation, or maybe the best innovation in, in carbon reduction, could come from a really small SME. 
uh, and we need to, to have a, a mechanism that uh, one recognises it but also has the ability to spread it fast uh, across the industry. Just having a pilot somewhere that did really well isn't what we're looking for. We're looking for the ability to find those, spread it, get it into our designs and into our, our use on projects. That's the challenge that we've got. OK, well, thanks to all of you. Stay right there, though, because uh, I can tell you there could be possibly an answer to the big five emission sources, electricity, heat, combustion engines, waste and materials. Let's hear now about a new global standard helping to make energy positive buildings and homes a reality and much more. Power Holes is a building that creates more energy than it uses during its lifetime operation, but it also includes the uh, embodied energy in the materials, uh, the construction phase and the end of life disposal of the building. And that's the difference between powerhouse and a traditional energy positive building, where you only include the uh, operational energy phase. In a powerhouse project, we basically use uh, known and existing technologies, but we put it together in a new way. We put all the different uh, skill sets together from day one around the same table, where they need to commit to uh, the powerhouse concept and the powerhouse targets. It's very important to find the right skill, but also the persons with the right mindset. The success of the Powerhouse Alliance is the five parties that came together to form the collaboration. They're all leading uh, companies in their industry. I believe the building industry plays a major role when it comes to climate change. Uh, we are named as the 40% industry when it comes to carbon emission and reusage and waste. And that is what powerhouse are up against. By completing a powerhouse product in Trondheim at 63 degrees north, we have proven that it is possible to build a powerhouse project within areas where you have a little daylight and a cold climate. So there is no excuse for not building it anywhere else. I am very proud about uh, what we have achieved in the Powerhouse Alliance um, and I hope that we will in the future as well uh, build projects that show uh, the way and inspire others to do the same. So it looks like collaboration could be the secret to this, to cracking this. Let's examine what this means. Julie, to you first of all, is collaboration the answer to reducing carbon emissions? Well, at UKGBC, we have over 450 members that span the whole value chain, and we see collaboration right at the heart of our sort of theory of change and our, and our raison d'etre, if you like. Um, so, yes, I think collaboration, we can't get there without it. Um, I would point to sort of two key tiers of collaboration, one industry-wide, um, and we've heard already some great initiatives that are happening, you know, roadmaps for concrete and cement. Um, with, there's a Responsible Steel initiative. There's a House Builder Federation roadmap. There's various roadmaps and uh, initiatives cropping up all over the place. What what we don't yet see is these all talking to one another in, in a really sort of co cohesive manner. Um, so one of the um, pieces of work that we will be working on with other green building councils is to create whole life carbon net zero roadmap. Um, you know, nation by nation, these will look different, but at least they will provide a signpost to who needs to do what by when and can we all make sure that we're going in the right direction um, and, and going in the same, same direction. Um, so, so that's the sort of industry-wide piece. I think then the peer-to-peer, company-to-company collaboration is absolutely critical. Um, you know, and I agree with Greg, you know, no one company can do this on its own. So actually um, uh, sharing knowledge, accelerating learning journeys, um, not necessarily sort of keeping this as a competitive issue within one business, but actually being prepared to um, broaden that out for others to, um, to, to learn and, and collaborate and take part um, in similar, uh, you know, uh, sustainability initiatives is really crucial. Um, so we run a contractors forum at UKGBC. In fact, Skanska's environment director, Adam Crossley, chairs that. Um, and that's really all about that knowledge sharing for 10 or so of the, the larger contractors to come together and say, you know, not, not hold this information sort of within their own businesses, but actually um, break, overcome barriers and break, um, break down challenges together. I think that's absolutely crucial as well. Jeremy, to you, how can the industry, do you think, be more collaborative, given it's so competitive by nature? Well, I think I should start by saying that, that globally, uh, cement research and development is already highly collaborative. Um, the Global Cement and Concrete Association, which was formed just over two years ago, 
looks at all kinds of research developments, particularly in manufacturing processes and how we can reduce CO2. Uh, I think also some of the, the competition can actually help. Uh, some years ago, we started burning solvent fuels and, and waste tires in our cement kilns, um, and we were paid to take those products away. Uh, now, through competition and people chasing those products, we actually have to buy them. Uh, but in buying them, that makes the supply chain to us much stronger, and we find a lot more of the products is available because we're actually paying for it rather than being paid to take it away. I think also we see collaboration across products, uh, and we see a lot of hybrid uh, structures where we have steel, um, concrete, and timber all working uh, in unison in one structure with each performing to its best in the right location in that building. I think it's important we do see collaboration between different product groups. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think collaboration vertically through the supply chain is very important. That early engagement throughout the entire supply chain to see what is possible uh, and design in sustainability, design out carbon at the early stages and design in efficiency as well uh, is, is vital to that collaboration. Do you think, Jeremy, that there, there is collaboration early enough in that supply chain? I think there is occasionally, and I think there are good examples, but I think there's a lot more to be done. Uh, I think, as Greg said earlier, I think I think you can definitely pick out examples, both from, from SMEs at the small end through to global and major mega projects at the top end, uh, but there are examples. I think the norm is not to have that collaboration. The norm is actually for, for each party to work in their own isolation um, and, and in, a, in a conservative and staid uh, fashion. I mean, Greg, in some areas, like, for example, health and safety, you do see so much collaboration. Um, do we see this in carbon, do you think? I, th I think we're seeing some collaboration, but maybe we should look at what is really good collaboration uh, um, look like in, in the industry. And the, probably the best recent example is, uh, is unfortunately with coronavirus. And as an industry, we've managed to incorporate the social distancing uh, measures and various different new procedures right away, right away across our industry onto all of our projects. And we did it in a matter of weeks because we chose to collaborate uh, as an industry. If we can apply that level of collaboration to carbon reduction, then I think we've got a chance to make a dent in this huge world challenge. Peter, does the industry collaborate early enough, do you think, to reduce carbon at the design stage? Um, I certainly think we need to do um, an awful lot more. Um, my mantra at HS2 is that um, no one's got a, a monopoly on good ideas. Um, so we need to reinforce collaboration at, at every level. And we've just introduced um, a, a new subgroup of our board, which will be chaired by Alan Cook, our chairman. Um, and that will open up um, an awful lot of challenge um, and scrutiny around what we're what we're doing. Um, and I'm also hoping, um, and to echo the earlier um, technological point, that we're going to uh, bring more of the sort of next generation thinking into the thinking around carbon reduction, because it's um, younger people who are really banging the drum to do better from a carbon and emissions perspective. And I think that um, those are the same people who are probably going to provide the best ideas to uh, deliver carbon reduction. I think organisationally, we've got um, a great setup through our in integrated project teams. So we definitely have framed the right um, way to go forward with collaboration. Um, but we've got to do a lot more to make that happen. Um, and at HS2, we're going to introduce a quarterly um, uh, collaboration event um, uh, to tackle carbon so that we make sure that it is on everyone's agenda every part of the year. But Peter, how do you think commercial models incentivise carbon reduction? Well, to be honest with you, I think that um, the, the biggest incentivisation is is the legal imperative to get to 2050 and, uh, and, and be uh, net zero. I think we got quite a journey to go on um, through the uh, construction industry um, to make those reductions. But with an organisation like ourselves along uh, the way, um, we should be able to encourage um, uh, better outcomes that will then have a, a trickle down effect on uh, many other construction sites. So going back to my earlier point about the super mega project, I think we will have great influence. But I think one area that we can really tackle um, and the area where we're going to put put some effort into innovating is we've got to get more energy um, uh, efficient 
Um, we've got to get those electrical, um, bigger electrical pieces of plant and equipment in place and running. Um, but we've also got to introduce um, hydrogen uh, as a better um, technology to sit alongside um, uh, uh, electric vehicles and electric production. Um, and the infrastructure has got to come along with that. Um, so we need to look to the energy industry to do uh, better in that space um, and to assist projects like ours and the construction industry to do better. I think without that, it's going to be difficult to get to net zero by 2050. But with it, I think we will probably get there sooner. Well, we've heard what our guests have to say. Let's now have a look at what you have to say. We asked you a poll question, and the question was to tell us what you think is the most critical factor in reaching net zero over the next 30 years. And it's really close between government legislation and collaboration, but government legislation just pips collaboration at the post. Greg, do you agree with the audience? Um, no, I don't fully. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry about that, audience. Um, I actually think that we, we've got to recognise that there are some big changes needed. So there are big innovations and we've got to push the need for innovation. The, the answer to climate in construction is actually going to come from our supply chain. Uh, and we've got to recognise that's where it's got to come from. If we can then collaborate to learn it fast and spread it everywhere, maybe incentivised by, by some things from government, but it does start with innovation. OK, well, listen, Peter Miller, Jeremy Greenwood, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you on this programme. Some really interesting debate there. Thank you so much. Greg and Julie, just stay with us for one minute longer because we did have another poll question we wanted to ask you. It's a bit of fun, really, for us here. Uh, it's asking you about how green you really think you are. And, uh, well, we asked you whether you think you are green, what shade of green, and the majority of you think you're minty green. I can tell you that means you use public transport but you love a good burger. Well, who doesn't? Julie, what shade of green are you? Well, I don't love a good burger because I'm not <laughs> vegan, but I, do, um, I, I, I don't eat meat. Um, so I'm probably in between uh, the moss and the mint, something like fern, perhaps. <laughs> um, uh, I do drive, but I drive a hybrid or an electric. And as I say, I don't eat meat, but I have just got myself and my family a puppy, which is probably the worst um, thing for my, our carbon Poor yes, thing. but it's super cute, so we'll forgive you that. <laughs> <laughs> and Greg, what about you? How green are you? I'm trying hard to be as green as possible. Uh, in fact, I've just recently made a commitment that my next company car will in fact be a full electric car. Uh, technically, it won't be green. I think it's going to be red, though. Um, a slightly flippant answer, maybe, but um, d l let me stick with the red part for a second because what I'm actually feeling at the moment is is a little bit red. I'm, I'm starting to I'm starting to get a little bit angry with our and I include uh, us as well with, with our lack of action in terms of this. As I said earlier on, we've had 40 years potentially of wasting time. And at the moment, I don't think we're creating uh, the burning platform that we actually need to really take action. And that's the bit that's starting to annoy me and possibly starting to turn me a little bit angry. Of course, coronavirus has been very much in focus and prioritised by so many governments globally. Do you think that is taking focus away from climate change and net carbon zero? Oh, you're, you're spot on. How many world leaders are we hearing in the media talking about climate change at the moment? Uh, and the, the exact COP26, unfortunately, has, has had to go back a full year. And, and we can't afford a year at the moment, so we need action. OK, Greg and Julie, thank you very much to both of you for joining us. It really has been an interesting and insightful debate and panel. And, uh, well, I have to say, I have definitely learnt a lot today. There are some really incredible examples of industry efforts to achieve net zero carbon out there. And, of course, there is so much more that needs to be done. Don't forget, you can watch the full exclusive interview with the Mayor of Bristol, Marvin Rees, and an extended film about Powerhouse, and also a recording of this entire show on YouTube. Thank you so much for your company. Bye-bye from us. Mm -hmm.